Hey, y'all, this is your man, Sabir Ali. So check this out, right? What questions, when you're on a date, are good questions to ask for you to make a determination as to whether that's going to be a second date, right? What are the questions, right? Beyond, beyond you asking the person what they do for a living, where they live, if they have any children, if they're married, Right beyond those questions, what do you ask? So if you ask a person like, "What do they do for a living?" and they tell you what they do for a living, do you ask them, "Well, how long have you been with that company? What are your plans uh, with that company? Do you plan on remaining there and and uh, pursuing upward mobility? Is this a short term goal for you? Is it a long term goal for you? Right, especially if you're looking for stability in a relationship, right?" If they have children and they say, yes, they do have children, what kind of relationship do they have with their children? Is it a strained relationship? What are they doing to fix that relationship? Right? What, what, what kind of relationship do they have with the mother of the child? Right? Those things are important to understand. Why? Because if you have children, how are they going to treat yours? If you have difficulty with yours, how are they going to help you with the difficulty with your own children? Right? Because when you enter into that relationship, you take on the role, right, of the extended parent of a sort, right? You don't replace your parent, but you have the same role in your home if you live together with that child. If you're in a relationship together, you have the same role as a parent. That's going to be important, right? Really important. Do you save money? How much do you save? How often do you save? What do you do with your savings? Is there a plan for your savings? Is this a vacation club? Right? Are you saving for a rainy day? Are you saving for a home? What is the intent behind your saving money? Because sometimes people just stack and stack and don't have any plans for it. And then next thing you know, you guys have been together for a year or two and this person went out and bought a damn boat. Well, is that for us? I, I didn't want a boat. I, I want a house. So now you, you're fighting over my money, my savings, but you never asked me what my plans were for, right? Do you want to marry? How long do you think we should be together before marrying? Because that's important to understand as well. A lot of people don't have that conversation and they're together three, four, five years and they're upset within themselves about the fact that they haven't married. It's important that you ask very specific questions, right? To determine whether you want to continue exhausting your energy, investing your life into a relationship that really is not going to meet your needs in the future. You got to ask the right questions. Peace. Hey, y'all, what's going on? This is your man, Sabir Aleem. So check this out. A lot of times I hear guys when, you know, when I'm doing the uh, fatherhood classes, complain about the ongoing conflicts with the mother of their children, Right how she's always doing this, how she nitpicks on this, how she doesn't allow that to happen, and all these other things. And what I do is I turn around and I ask them, I say, okay, so why do you think she reacts that way toward you? Why? And the first thing you say, well, I don't know. She's just like that. I said, okay, well, let's talk about the relationship. Are the two of you still together? No. Okay. Why did you break up? And they'll go into a whole bunch of, you know, things about why he broke up and so on and so forth. And then after hearing, so I said, do you think that she's angry about the failed relationship? And uh, no, well, no, I don't think it is, you know, it's that because she's with somebody else. Okay, but that wasn't the question. The question was, do you think she's angry with you about the failed relationship, especially seeing how you have a child together? Uh, then, then they begin to see, well, yeah, maybe that's a possibility and so forth. Okay, all right. So uh, then I said, well, what have you done about having a conversation with her about resolving the failed relationship between you as husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is you called yourselves, right? And uh, they, they found that they typically haven't created an opportunity to have that discussion because most of the time when they converse, it's... Uh, about a particular thing regarding a child, maybe visitation, maybe, you know, clothing, maybe the child's needs or something. So, but they never take the time to pick up the phone. Just sporadically pick up the phone, impulsively pick up the phone and have a conversation 
about what happened and what they would like to do about resolving that. Then the last thing I asked them is, are you still sleeping with her? You hear crickets in that moment. And they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, every now and then we kind of get together because that wasn't a problem in a relationship. I said, well, that's the problem in the relationship now. It wasn't then, but it's your problem now. If you are done as a couple in a relationship, you need to move into parent mode. Sleeping together is not parent mode. Keep that in mind. If you're done, be done, move on. Sleeping together will only make this more difficult for you to transition to your roles of parents. Y'all have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all, this is your man, Sabir Aleem. So check this out. One of the things that we really have to come to understand in regards to parenting is that we, we both we both have our own uh, ways of parenting. We, we all have our own styles of parenting. So if you have a style of parenting that is uh, pretty much passive, non-confrontational, lackadaisical, right? Like, you don't believe in beating the child. You don't believe in any form of physical punishment, right? No spanking, none of those things. But then you're with someone who does have that style of parenting, right? Now you find yourself at odds with one another all the time about how that child should not have been punished or how disciplined should not have been in that capacity because there's a difference between punishment and discipline, right? We keep hearing the term, I'm going to put you on punishment, right? But punishment has no structure to learning. You can say, well, I beat his behind or I beat her behind and I guarantee they won't do it no more. I guarantee they will do it again. I guarantee because there was nothing learned about the behavior. You just told me it was wrong. You just ran all these superlatives out of your mouth and told me how wrong my behavior was. Right? That's all you did. When you look at disciplining, discipline entails learning. So you may have something taken away from you. But whatever is taken away from you, right, should be something that is relevant to the behavior that I presented. Right? That, that's important to understand. Then it has to be some dialogue, right? There has to be some kind of task that the child needs to be able to uh, follow, to be, you know, you have to assign the child a task that they can perform, right? Which helps them to understand the significance of changing that behavior. But when you have both of you who are looking at two totally opposite sides of the spectrum in terms of how to discipline a child, right? You're never going to get the child where the child needs to be because they're in the middle of your insanity. So the first thing that you need to begin to do is talk, talk about your styles of, of discipline, right? And how you're going to raise the child when it comes to particular areas. Case in point, what's happening right now? We deal with that. Don't bring out the laundry list. Deal with that stuff right now, right? And we're going to start with this one issue at a time. And we're going to talk about how we should deal with this behavior together before we approach the child. Y'all have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all, this is your man, Sabir Aline. So check this out. When you meet someone, right? You meet someone at the club, for instance. They look good. They smell good. They drop it like it's hot on the dance floor. Y'all hook up, right? I mean, hook up. Y'all hook all the way up. Y'all go all the way in. Y'all go home to somebody's home. Y'all go to the hotel. Y'all get in it, right? Next day, phone call comes. Want to holler at you a minute? See what you're doing? What's going on? What's happening? What you want to do today? What's happening this week? And all those things start to happen. But when you're, when you're thinking about it, you say, okay, well, every, that was last night. Um, we were at the club. I was feeling you at the club. Uh... I don't, I don't know that I'm feeling you that way now, right? And it wasn't the fact that I was drunk because I may not have even been drunk. But it was a moment. 
It was a moment for you. And now this person has feelings, right? After last night's performance in the crib. How do you tell that person, right? It was just a, a, a one night stand. It was just something to do. Did you tell me that last night? Did you? Was it made clear last night before we went hard in the paint that this was going to be a one night stand? So now this person is devastated. You ever been in that position before? Right? Were you just hooked up that night? Y'all just got it in? And the next day that person is in love? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them being in love with you because there's different levels of love. But I'm simply saying that now they're in a position where they're, they're all broke up because they're in their feelings because they were really feeling it. Because of the value they have of giving themselves to somebody else. Right? Because you didn't have that discussion about how I value myself. I value having sex to the degree of that's a very intimate part of me that I'm giving to you. And I felt like in that moment, that's what we were both feeling. And you, you're like, you don't have the same value of yourself. What does that discussion look like? Right? And how do you stop having that discussion over and over and over again? There is a solution. You need to be up front and direct. Yo, listen, this is just for tonight. It ain't beyond tonight. Think about it. Moving forward, when you meet, be, be up front and direct with a lot of things. And you can, you can save yourself some pain and the other person. Peace. Hey, y'all, what's going on? This is your man, Sabir Aleem. So check this out, right? You know, you, you hear a lot of people talking about uh, wanting to get married. Uh, they talk about, you know, who's going to be, you know, in attendance, who the best man is going to be, the matron of honor, the maid of honor, what the colors are going to be, what kind of dress, what kind of tuxedo is going to be worn to place. And all, all those things have all that conversation, right, about marriage. And not one thing in that conversation is talking about the commitment to marriage, the ideal of marriage. Not the idea, because right now that's all they're talking about is the idea of marriage. They haven't even talked about the ideal. And the ideal of marriage is just that. What is going to be our foundation? Right? Is it going to be me, you, and God? Or is it going to be me, you, your mother, your father, your aunt? Who, who's it going to be? What is going to be our go-to source when things begin to go to the left? Right? What are you going to do? When difficult times come upon you as an individual, are you going to handle those things on your own? Are you going to include your spouse in this decision? How are you going to deal with those kind of things? If you lose your job and your financial picture changes for you as an individual, are you going to remain with your partner? Or are you going to think that it's just something your partner shouldn't have to bear and you go live with your parents? How are you going to handle those things? Right? Because you have to understand that when you enter into marriage, that's an important step. It's just me and you against the world. Period. And our foundation has to be established before marriage. Before marriage. Because when things start getting rocky between you and I, we need to be able to go to this source of your strength, of your convictions, and say, hey, this is how we're going we gonna to address this. Right. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a go to source that's already been established, it's not going to be long before it crashes and burns, because that's just the nature of relationships. It, it entails work. But when you start having a conversation about marriage, get beyond the wedding, because the wedding is not the marriage. The wedding is not the marriage, folks. Stop getting it confused. There's more to it than that. And we need to be having that discussion more frequently. All right? Y'all have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all. What's going on? This is your man, Sabir Aleem. So check this out. I often have conversations with people about marriage. And no, by far, I am not a marriage expert. But I have been married four times. And people often frown and like, oh, four times. What are you doing wrong? 
But nobody has the conversation about the fact that, wow, dude, that's you. Yeah, you tried it four times. That's bold. That's brave. You know, I had an aunt who I called and I told her that, you know, well, you know, Aunt, aunt D, I'm on my fourth marriage now. And, uh, you know, don't know which way this one is going to go, but I I'm trying it. You know, she said, well, baby, you just keep on trying until it, until it works, till you find when it works. Right. So many other people want to sit down and say, well, you know, you're doing this wrong and that wrong. and You don't know this. and You don't know that. So on and so forth. And many times, these are people who haven't been married one time. Or maybe have been married one time and won't go back to marriage again. Or maybe in a marriage themselves, that's not even a healthy marriage. But they have so much to say about the fact that I've told them I've been married four times. Well, I started marrying at the age of 24 years old. I'm 57 right now, and I'm on my fourth marriage. I don't know how to be anything other than a husband. Right. So I delve into relationships hard because I take responsibility for caring for that relationship, for nurturing that relationship. And what you have to begin to look at is this. Are you in a relationship that is nurturing to your spirit, that is nurturing to your needs? Do you know what your needs are? Do you really know what your needs are? And do you know if that person is capable of fulfilling those needs? Right. See, marriage is not an easy thing. It takes work. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of compromise. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of willingness. It takes a lot. And everybody's not built like that. Everybody, you know, can't just walk into a marriage. And if they have so much unresolved in their own personal lives as individuals and to pair up with somebody else, that's a challenge. So if you're not really ready for marriage, you need to tell the other person that you're not really ready for marriage. And maybe establish a timeline of when maybe that can happen. And by the time you reach that point in the timeline and it hasn't happened, maybe you need to make a decision if marriage is what's on your mind. Y'all have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all. What's going on? This is your man, Severe Aline. So, it's, it's a funny thing, right? You know, you ever see somebody... And you look at look at that person and be like, yo, now that is marriage material. That's a keeper. I would marry that one. Just by a sheer glance, a look at that person's physical appearance, you've come to the conclusion that that would be a good wife, a good husband. Just based on what you see, right? And sometimes we see actions and behaviors in certain situations where, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Right? But it's another part to that. See, there's a difference between wanting to be a wife and wanting to have a husband. There's a big difference in that statement. See, when you say you want that to be your husband or that's, that's the person you want, you know, uh, to be in your life because they have performed certain things that you find to be attractive, right? So you want that. That's what I want. That's going to be my husband, right? Then you get into the situation where marriage is talked about. And you start finding out some things, right? That uh, maybe, hmm. Now, I just want that to be my husband. I don't want all the other stuff because sometimes people can't do all the other stuff. Sometimes people don't know how to problem solve. Sometimes people don't know how to share. Sometimes people haven't outgrown the self-centeredness of a child. and They're still me, 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 and everything is all about them. Right? Sometimes people just don't want to do certain things. They don't want to, what is that? Obey their husband. They don't want to yield to the decisions of the husband. Right. They're not ready for those kind of things. See, they want a husband. But they don't want to be a wife. Right. Because those are all the things that comes along with being a wife. Right. And understanding where your role is as the wife and where his role is as the husband. And sometimes when you start looking at those roles because of your conditioning, you have internal conflicts and those internal conflicts turns into external conflicts between you and your husband. So be careful. 
When you start talking about marriage, make sure you understand the difference between you wanting to be a wife and you just wanting to have a husband. Because it makes all the difference in the world for a long-lasting marriage. Y'all have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all, this is your man, Sabir Aleem. So check this out, right? You know, there's, there's a lot of dialogue that I often hear, you know, between parents. And I hear a lot of, especially when I do uh, fatherhood courses. Um, when the guys talk about how when they met the mother of their child, that they were out hustling. I mean, they were clocking. They were selling drugs. They was up in the club. They was doing all those kind of things. That was the lifestyle they were living. That's how they, they made their money, right? They had to go out on the paper chase on a regular on a regular basis, hustle up that paper so they can be able to provide whatever it was they were providing for the mother and or child, right? But one of the things that he talked about was how that relationship changed because the mother of the child got tired of, you know, hearing, I, I got to go out and make this money. I can't sit here and do this right now. I got to go out and make this money. The mother wanted them to give up that lifestyle. She felt as though because like, yo, listen, you have a child now. You can't continue to do this, right? Because your child needs to be here. You need to be here for your child, right? And you're not here for your child when you're out every every day, going out hustling, making some money. You come in this time of night, that time of the night, this time of the morning, Right. On the weekends, we hardly have any time because you want to get rest because you got to go out and then do your hustle later on in the evening. So it's no kind of relationship here. And they say, but damn, I, I had this kind of relationship when, when she met me. This is my lifestyle when she met me. And now all of a sudden it's a problem. Right. And guess what? I agree with them. I agree 100 percent with them, because when you enter into a relationship with someone who is living the street life, who was on that paper chase, who's on that kind of hustle, that ain't going to change. That is my job. That's how I've been taking care of you. That's how I've been taking care of myself. So you made a conscious decision to enter into this relationship with the person who has that way of living. Don't have the expectation because they have a child that they're supposed to change that. That is my job. That's how I ride. That's how I roll. So before you make a decision, to get sexually involved and have unprotected sex with a person who has that lifestyle, you need to think twice. Because if and when you get pregnant, are you willing to stay with that person through all of that and expose the child to these kind of conditions as well? Because it's not just about you anymore. It's about the child because you made it about the child in your conversation as well. But it's always about the child first and foremost. So take a look at that. If that person was riding like that, then they're going to continue to ride like that until they get done. And you can't make them get done. You have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all, this is your man, Sabir Aline. So have you ever had something, a behavior that you wanted to stop because it was just having a negative impact upon your life? I know I have, right? I can think about the years that I used and abused drugs and alcohol and how so many times people told me that I needed to stop. And in my heart, I wanted to stop. But it was no, no matter what anybody told me, I just wasn't ready to stop because there was so much unresolved within me that kept, that kept leading me back to the same thing over and over again. That I had no other means of resolve but to use drugs and alcohol. Well, at least that's what I thought. Right? So I had repeated failed attempts. But even though I failed at stopping, the seed had been planted. The process had begun for me to move towards a willingness to stop. So I haven't used drugs and alcohol since 1994. April 17th to be exact. I've never turned back. I've never saw a reason to resort to using drugs and alcohol as a means to bring resolve to the unresolved within my life. Like any other relationship, right? When you are with someone and they are practicing a behavior, right, that you're not pleased with, 
that you find to be unbecoming? Do you really want to invest time, energy, and effort into getting them to stop when they're not doing the same? Because they're just not willing? Because they're just not ready? Or because they don't realize at this point that it's a problem? No matter how many times you tell a person something is a problem, doesn't necessarily mean that they see it as being a problem. So you really need to take a look at the relationship that you're in. If there are behaviors that are displeasing to you, what are you going to do about it other than talk to them about it? Because you can talk to your blue in the face if they are not ready, willing, and able at this time to do it, then you need to make a decision about how you want to handle being in this relationship. Because I've been a clinician for many years, and I can tell you, people will not stop until they're ready. But what are you, what are you ready to do right now? Because if it interferes with your life, your hopes, dreams, and aspirations, then maybe you need to move on. Y'all have a great day. Peace. Hey, y'all, this is your man, Sabir Arlene. So I hear a lot of people complain constantly about not having enough money, right, to proceed with achieving their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. You know, they say that they need uh, this equipment or that equipment, you know, in order to be able to uh, do a thing, right? Here's one of the things that I've learned, right? I've been making videos, right? for years. And it all started out with a, a, a $50 Canon short shot camera and a $10 tripod. And I just started taking the information that I've learned throughout all of the years as a professional, personally, right? And those things that I see that happen in life every day. And I started formatting, right, um, a, a show. I did blog talk radio. I have videos on YouTube. You know, I've done I've done a book, you know, that I self-publish, right? I've done a film that I directed and produced myself, edited myself. I did all those things. I bought some uh, software, right? And uh, the software, you know, I just look for different software. And you have software right on your computer, a movie maker, all kind of different things that you can use, right? I took all of those things. And I took all of my ideas and my abilities and my talents that I've, I've had throughout all of the years. And I used those things. And I start making these videos on my own, right? It was an investment that I needed to make. Then I gradually moved into buying other video equipment, investing into other video equipment, catching things on sale, making use of what I already have at home. I invested into more tripods. Tripods don't cost much. You just got to know where to go, right? Then I invested in, in video uh, photography umbrellas. I invested into a camera. It wasn't very expensive. Waited till it went on sale. Saved my money. Bought it on the credit card. But I've been investing in myself throughout the course of the years. With social media, you can reach millions of people and never even leave the home. So when I hear people complaining constantly about not being able to have enough money to do, do this, not being able to have enough money to do that, I say to y'all, stop it. Stop it. Stop complaining. If this is what you really want to do, you need to go in hard in the pain. You need to make it happen because you can make it happen. So stop complaining. If I can do it, so can you. It just takes time. Nothing is going to happen overnight. Nothing. It's your process for everything. And I'm still learning and still practicing my craft. Y'all have a great day. Peace.